Lord Jesus Christ, though Christmas is now past, we thank you that we can still rejoice in you, that we can still join in the song that is being sung even now in heaven, that the shepherds glimpsed at that Christmas morning. We worship you, no longer a baby, but high and lifted up. You lived and died and rose again, and now you're in the place of majesty and authority where the angels endlessly praise you. And you're the same yesterday, today and forever. You are still a saviour born to us, Christ the Lord. And we still live in a world which has suffered long, which is weary, in which we are weary often. But we thank you for this opportunity to step aside to stop and rest and focus our gaze upon you. We ask that by the Holy Spirit you might teach us today of yourself as we look at the Bible. Help us to know more of who you are and why you came. Help us to hear the, the promises we have in you, to trust in them and to know the comfort and peace and joy that only you can bring in amidst a world which is often frustrating. 
Help us through this then to worship and adore you, the Father and the Spirit, one God together in this week to come. Help us to glorify and enjoy you above any other. We pray this in your name. Amen. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said to the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said to the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said to the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Well, that passage isn't exactly Christmassy, as we would traditionally define it. People today talk about the having the Christmas spirit and having the Christmas feelings, and that passage is far from that. Rather than being saccharine escapism, this is bitter experience. However, I want us to stop today and think about this passage. Because I think if we do, we will see that this is actually the Christmas spirit, strange as it seems. I think we can see that in three contradictions in the passage. Glorious contradictions, in a way, which teach us not just of this story, but God's greater purposes. Let's begin with flight and rescue. So our story begins with Mary and Joseph, they're in Bethlehem still with Jesus. The wise men have left. We're not really sure how much time has passed. There was probably some time passed between the shepherds arriving and then the Magi. Maybe up to two years, we don't know, since Jesus' birth. But some devastating news comes. Joseph is told by an angel through a dream again that there is trouble afoot. They're in danger. They must flee. And they do. They take flight to Egypt. What can we say about this? It's very quickly different from the scene we tend to imagine on Christmas cards. We tend to think of some kind of romanticised view of Mary and Joseph sitting, adoring. And I'm sure there's a bit of that, but quickly there is suffering for them. Maybe you've seen the news over the months. You, you, you see these horrible pictures of folks trying to cross the channel to get to the UK. Now, quickly in these things, it descends into some political debate about refugees and migrants and how we should deal with that. And I'm not addressing that today. But I want you just to imagine for a second what it's like. 
to have your only option, your best option to be to give your life savings to cross the channel. Consider these people as people, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, what they must have gone through to get to this point. What it must be like to leave behind your country, your culture, your family, your language. That's what happened to Mary and Joseph. But for them there was no RNLI to scoop them up, no UN programme, no aid workers. They fled to Egypt. We don't know how they survived. We really don't know anything about this point of Jesus' life at all. We just know there's flight. There's lots we could say about this. But I think what's key here for us to see as we are unfolding this picture that Matthew is giving us of what the Messiah is, who the Messiah is, we see that from the very beginning, Jesus' sufferings begin. Isn't that interesting? Just as he came into the world, eventually to suffer, so his sufferings were from the beginning. And in that, he was experiencing real life and identifying with our suffering. I don't know how your life is at the moment, whether you got to spend Christmas as you wanted, what the next weeks will make for you. I'm sure there's all of us in different ways are struggling with the pandemic, suffering under the troubles of it. And maybe for you as well as that, there are other troubles, non-pandemic related, maybe made worse by the pandemic, other fears, other worries, other struggles, maybe some that you would be struggling to even have anyone to talk to about. Maybe only one or two people know. Just as we think on Jesus and his sufferings, if you're a Christian person, you have a saviour and a king who has suffered. As you go to him in prayer, you're going to one who understands. He has seen this world in all its pain. He has experienced distresses and anxieties and the things brought around by the suffering of the world, by rejection, by being hunted. He knows what it is to have people hate you. He knows what it is to flee. So you can go to Jesus in prayer, one who has suffered. He has grace sufficient for you and help from his throne of grace. So there's flight, but there's also rescue. In this flight, we're told that there are words being fulfilled from the prophet Hosea. Out of Egypt I called my son. Even in the chaos, God is fulfilling his plan. And there are two significant things about that. The first is that we're supposed to see here Jesus as a new Moses. Later we'll come to the massacre of the innocents. But as these themes start to come together, Egypt a massacre of innocence. Any person reading this who knows the Old Testament knows that we're being taken back to the Exodus, where one baby survived to be the leader and lawgiver of God's people, to lead them out of slavery into God's redemption. That's what's happening again, Matthew's telling us. There's a greater redemption. This Messiah has come to lead God's people. And secondly, he's also a new Israel. Maybe you remember over these last weeks as we've looked at Matthew's gospel, he's very keen to show us 
fulfillment. He's showing us that there's a greater, bigger story here. And in that greater, bigger story, we see that Israel failed. But now Jesus himself is a new Israel. One who will follow God's ways. And he will be the head of a new people. Both Jew and Gentile coming together. And in this, we're seeing God's greater rescue, God's greater plan, the greater fulfilment of all of those Old Testament promises, a blessing to Abraham, of a king who will last forever from David. And everything is coming together. So, although it seems bizarre, although it seems like there's chaos, although it seems like Jesus is having to flee and things are falling apart, that's not the case. There's flight and rescue. And in these contradictions, God is working out his plan. He is showing us who the Messiah is. He's wonderfully showing us and fulfilling his great plan. And we're supposed to go, wow, what a Messiah. Doing what could not be done before. He truly is God come to lead his people and fulfil his plans. So these contradictions are amazing, aren't they? Let's see another one. So there's secondly struggle and sovereignty. And firstly, we, the struggle we see. Well, Matthew has shown us that Mary and Joseph have gone off now into the distance. They won't return for a while. But rather than follow them, Matthew takes us another place. He takes us to Jerusalem again, back to the temple, back to Herod, who realises that the Magi have not told him where the baby is and he won't be able to kill him and he flies into a rage. And he orders this despicable thing, this blanket killing of the baby boys in Bethlehem and in the surrounding area. It's harrowing. Scholars have tried to consider how many baby boys maybe died. And one estimate is maybe around 20, which is maybe less than you imagined, but no less sickening. Someone once said, this was like they were done blame. We know that's something that has affected that place. And so it is. Absolutely sickening. Absolutely horrible. All for the sake of struggle, clinging to power. But there's also a struggle in this episode we don't see. Later in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 12, we get a different view of the same event. A cosmic view, a God-eye view. It's all in picture language. But the pictures are that there's a child born to a woman and a fierce dragon comes onto the scene who is waiting to kill the child. He's identified as Satan. He hates God. He hates God's people. He hates God's purposes. He is ready to disrupt them. But God intervenes and swoops in and saves the child and whisks it away to the wilderness for a time. And in this, I think we're supposed to see, one thing we're supposed to see, is that despite the fact that it seems an utter tragedy and evil running amok from our perspective in Bethlehem at that point, it was part of a wider struggle. There was a greater cosmic struggle going on at the same time. I don't know what you normally do on Boxing Day. We often would go for a walk and watch a film. And the kind of films I like to watch at this time of year are those big blockbuster films. You know, the ones that often have this big sense of good and evil. Maybe one of them is Star Wars. And one of the things I like about the Star Wars films is that you have this ability to have 
battles going on, but it's all the same struggle. So you have these great battles going on with big star destroyers and spaceships, and that means something. But there's also a battle going on in the ground on the different planets, between individuals, and it's all part of the same struggle. And that's what we see here. There is a great struggle going on in the universe and in the heavens, it seems. But God is working out his purposes. So though there is struggle and things seem chaotic and dangerous, there is also sovereignty. But there's a difference here between Star Wars and the Bible. In Star Wars, there's a battle between good and evil, and there's a seeking to be balanced in the force. But here it's different. There is real struggle that we see, there's real struggle we don't see. But somehow God is always sovereign over all of it. The, the forces competing are not equal. We see it in different things. We see it firstly in the fact that God warns Joseph before Herod can get to him. And we see it also in the quote there in verse 18. A voice is heard in Rama, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Why did Matthew choose this quote? I'm sure there were lots of reasons. It articulates the deep pain felt by the mothers in this tragedy. It reminds those who read it what we saw earlier, that God knows and understands our suffering. But many of the Psalms and prophecies speak of that. I think there's something else. Part of the reason is that there's a wider context in Jeremiah 31 that this is taken from. It is, has an original setting of hope. Jeremiah speaks to the exiles, to those who disobeyed God before and had been reject, ejected out of the land. But God was saying he would soon bring a new covenant. In that new covenant, he would put the law in their minds and on their hearts, that through the Messiah, his people would be established forever. And now Matthew is using this quote to show us that even among the horror of these children being massacred, somehow God is still working to fulfil his plans. The Messiah is here. He has been whisked to safety. The promise of hope is still there. And it has come. Well, how can this help you and me? As we come to the end of this strange year, 2021, I think firstly it teaches us that we shouldn't look to simple answers in amongst tragedies. It's so easy, isn't it, to say, well, this is what God is doing or that is what God is doing. But we don't know. There's often the struggle and pain we see and there's often something we don't see. There's a cosmic element, a spiritual warfare that we do not always understand or see the bigger picture of. Sometimes... Satan does lead evil, sinful people to do evil things, and it is tragic. But at the same time, when these things happen, in whatever form, we know and we trust that none of this is out with God's overruling. We don't really understand that, but what we do see throughout the big picture of the Bible, of God's picture of redemption, story of redemption, is that he is always wise and he is always good and that somehow he is working out his greater plan in Christ. Which means I think we can turn to God in our confusion, in our frustration, in our pain and seek him and seek Christ because in him God's promises are real to us. In him his love and compassion is ours. In him, his leading is ours, whatever we face. Finally, we see significance and insignificance. If you've been following along with what we've been doing together as we look through Matthew's Gospel this Christmas, you'll know that Matthew has been all about the significance of Jesus. 
He began with that genealogy, didn't he? That he showed that Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is the Messiah. Then we saw that Jesus is the one who will save his people from their sins. And that he is God Emmanuel. And then with the Magi, we saw that he welcomes outsiders because he is a king who will bring people close to God by his death. And then even today we've seen that Jesus is a new Moses, the new Israel. Matthew has been all about the fact that Jesus is significant. But then did you notice in this last part of the story how in some ways there's insignificance? When Joseph gets the green light to come back to Israel, he comes back but is warned not to go to Judea but to the very extreme north of the country to this region called Galilee. Now let me tell you something about Galilee. When that time of the exile that I was talking about happened, when Israel were conquered, Galilee wasn't even worth conquering. These are people up the far north who weren't considered much and with funny accents. Do you remember, if you remember the part in Jesus' uh, arrest when Peter is there before the fire and someone says to him, well, you speak like them. You've got that strange accent. You can imagine that people from Galilee were looked down upon. Oh, the Galileans. And worse for Jesus, he was then settled in Nazareth. And do you remember in John, we're told that one of the disciples even says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, there's a great beauty in this. The fact that Jesus became a Nazarene. It, it shows that God really did plan that his son would come to be one of us. Emmanuel, God with us. That he came to ordinary people. Imagine what it would have been like for Jesus as he grew up and began his ministry. And as he went to these cities like Jerusalem. And as he spoke to the good and the great, the tax collectors, the Pharisees. They would have sneered and looked down at him, even for his accent. But that was God coming so close to the lowest and the needy. And, you know, as we are people who are from somewhere, which is in the extreme north, where people have different accents, where we feel often we're left behind, I hope you see that Jesus came for people like us, wickers. No one is too far away for him. No one is too low for him. No one is too small for him. He is God come to us to be the Messiah. To be all the things that I said already that are significant. But in his insignificance, we see something beautiful. That he really has drawn near, that we might come to God for ourselves. That we might be included in his promises and his purposes. If we trust in Jesus for everything we need before God. Trust him to be the saviour that he says he is. Trust him to be God Emmanuel. I don't know who you are. One of the funny things about recording these videos is this video could be watched by anyone anywhere, at any point in their life. Maybe you're someone who worries that God wouldn't have anything to do with you. You're too sinful. You're not important enough. But the fact that Jesus became a Nazarene tells you all you need to know. You can come to him. Confess your faults. Confess how you've turned from God. Recognise that he alone is your way to God. And that he can be your saviour and your messiah. And you will find that he will take you and welcome you and make you his. And will bind himself to you. And will lead you now through this life. 
he came down and became a Nazarene. There's significance in his insignificance. And so then, as we finish today, I hope you see that while this passage isn't immediately, obviously, Christmassy, this is a much better Christmas spirit than what our world often talks about. A Christmas spirit, feeling the Christmas feels, is usually about distraction, it's about escapism, it's about trying to feel a bit fuzzy inside because there's not much else to feel good about. But here, in the midst of struggle, in the midst of flight, in the midst of insignificance. God is showing us what the true Christmas is. That Jesus has come to be the Messiah. And that in him God is working out his sovereign plan, his great rescue, something of wonderful significance for all who trust in him and for the universe. So as you come to the end of 2021, it may be that you're thinking, well, I just want to get rid of this year. Maybe it is that God has been doing things that you do not understand. Maybe it is that he's been shaping you and moulding you, helping you as you persevere, building your character, building your trust in him. Who knows what God might do? of 2022. Maybe you fear it. Maybe you're not sure about what this new year will bring. But look to Jesus. Don't walk by sight. Live by faith. Trust that he, the Messiah, is yours and he's working out his plan. Lord God, at the end of this year, we want to come before you and we want to give you thanks for all we have struggled in different ways this year, individually and together as a church. We recognise that there is so much that you have got done, so much you have given, that you have been faithful to your promises at all times, that you have never left us or forsaken us, that you have, have never failed us, 
And so, Lord, we're so thankful for your your daily grace, daily bread, spiritually and physically, how you provided for our needs in different ways. But, Lord, we also want to ask that you would teach us, teach us to be thankful for the things that still cause us hurt and pain. Teach us to be thankful for all the darker parts of this year. Help us to know a peace with what you have done in our lives and in this world. Lord, we know that part of that is that we need to confess our sin, confess our unbelief, confess our purposeful turning from you and your ways, trusting in an ultimate sense in the created things rather than you the creator, seeking to derive our comfort and peace from them ultimately rather than you. And you are so great and so gracious. So Lord, we're sorry for this. And we ask that now you would forgive us. We ask for your leading into this new year and that whatever it faces, we would know that you are with us and that you will remain faithful to your promises. We thank you that today we have seen that you are working out your purposes in amidst struggle and flight and insignificance. And so, Lord, whatever we are to face in this new year, help us to go forward in faith, trusting in you, the God who does such amazing things. Your ways are not our ways. And yet we, we adore you and we worship you, for your ways are always best and always wise and always good. We ask that you would help us in this new year to know our Saviour more, to walk with him, to grow to be more like him, to glorify him with all of our lives. Help us also to keep persevering in hope, hope not of life returning to what we want it ultimately, but hope in Christ and in the ultimate salvation that will come to us when he is revealed one day. We ask, Lord, that you would set that to be our compass at the beginning of the new year, and that you would do this for your glory's sake. Amen.